very warm welcome to all of you to HIA's next session on projects or project-based learning. We are now at the halfway mark uh, on, uh, in our journey on HIA's Summer of Learning. And um, for those of you who have been a part of this journey, we welcome you back. To those of you who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you to HIA. HIA is a teacher development, professional development company, um, and we've been working over the last three months to bring all of you, as you've jumped ship to teaching online and teaching remotely, uh, we've been bringing you all the support and all the help that you might need along the way so that we can prepare ourselves better for classrooms of the future. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Pallavi Devedi and I'm the founder of Hire. And we have with us today three extremely special guests for a topic that is very, very close to my own heart, both as an educator as well as um, a 21st century uh, citizen of the world. How is it that we can help our students understand the world around us better? How can we activate uh, their, their sense of uh, what's around them and engage them and help them get all hands on with their learning. Uh, and the most amazing way of doing that, in fact, is projects. So I'm going to very quickly start sharing my screen with all of you so that um, we get a sense of what we're going to be doing today. And I will then quickly introduce you um, to our panelists as well. Uh, before we do that, uh, some very quick housekeeping rules. Um, in this session, you are not visible to the panelists. We also will not be using the raise the hand uh, button. So if at all, at any point in time, any of you have any questions, any observations, uh, we request you to put your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll be seeing at the bottom of your screens. Um, and if there are any observations or anything you'd like to share, please go right ahead and put it in the chat box. Questions specifically, though, in the Q&A, because it's easier for us to find them there. Uh, and uh, just, just as a gentle reminder, let's please be kind. Uh, let's please use the chat box with as much discretion as we can. This is a space for open learning and sharing, uh, but let's also exercise as much kindness and discretion as we can. Um, and lastly, uh, just so that um, you, know, you, you know better, um, we do not offer any certificates for our webinars. Our webinars are open learning events. Um, and, you know, we invite all of you to come in and, and, and listen to our panelists and share your learning and, and learn from what other people are doing in their classrooms. Uh, if you are interested, we do run certification workshops, which you can sign up for on our website as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce you very quickly to today's panel. Uh, the first of them, uh, of our panelists today, uh, is Susie Boss. Susie Boss is no stranger to those of you who are familiar with project-based learning and are project-based learning enthusiasts. She is a, uh, an acclaimed author uh, and has written loads of books uh, on project-based learning. She's also a consultant uh, when it, with, uh, with PBL Works and a national faculty with them uh, and is a project-based learning advocate and enthusiast. Um, second on our panel is Sandeep Kaur. Sandeep is the IBPYP coordinator at the Heritage Experiential School in Gurugram. And she is also um, a, a PBL enthusiast when it comes to getting her kids in the primary uh, all excited about uh, learning through projects. Um, last but not the least, we have with us today Janvi Sampat Sangvi. Janvi is representing the Penpal Schools, which is a wonderful collaborative uh, to bring students across the world together uh, in learning through projects. And Janvi will be talking to us a little bit about what she does with her students through Penpal Schools and how she's been using Penpal Schools uh, for projects. Uh, so without further ado, um, I, will, I will set today's ball rolling um, and get our session going. Uh, and I'd like to invite our first panelist, uh, Susie, to get us started with her session uh, and talk to us a little bit about what she's been doing uh, with project-based learning. So over to you, Susie. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me just share my screen and we'll get started. One moment. 
Okay. All right, great. So um, how wonderful to see such strong interest in project-based learning. I see the numbers just rolling into this webinar. So that's very exciting. Um, and it's fun for me to be connecting uh, with India. It's a place where I've spent a lot of time over the last decade working with teachers. So I know the interest in project-based learning is very high. So let's jump right into why project-based learning. If this is new to you or if it's something you want to get more involved with, when I work with teachers and we get started on our PBL journeys, as we talk about, um, we start with the why. Why this form of learning and why is it important now, particularly now when education has been so disrupted around the world. Um, and we often start with some backward design and think about your future graduates. So when your students leave you at the end of their schooling, whether that's elementary or high school, um, what is it that you want them to know and be able to do? Those big questions. What sort of people are you nurturing and encouraging through the sorts of learning that's happening? And these are the sorts of words that come up over and over again in contexts all around the world. Um, you know, we want people who are globally connected, who are creative problem solvers, who have confidence and a sense of what they're about, a sense of agency. They're self-starters, uh, they're collaborative. We hear these words over and over again. And then the question is, how do we get there? How do we help students arrive at that place where they have all this, uh, you know, these competencies and these really important skills for the 21st century? So project-based learning becomes a natural route to helping us get there. And I think particularly right now, when we're seeing the whole world focused on this global pandemic, and all around the world, we see collaboration happening across nations and among scientists and, um, you know, everywhere uh, folks are focused on the same issue. Uh, we see the need for all the sorts of 21st century skills that we talk about students needing. So if we want our students to be the ones who are ready to tackle whatever challenges are going to be ahead for them to be the sorts of people who can be, you know, agile and uh, react to change and be ready to tackle whatever challenges come their way as adults. Project-based learning is a really great strategy for helping them get to that point of um, being ready to tackle the world and, and their role in it. So let's look a little more deeply at what project-based learning means and what it's all about. Um, I, uh, as, as Blavi mentioned, I'm a part of the national faculty of an organization in the U.S. where I live called PBL Works. And for a long time, um, decades, this nonprofit organization has focused on high quality project based learning. How do we help more teachers understand what this is all about so that more students can benefit from this really transformative approach to teaching and learning? And what we found over time is that not all projects um, achieve the same great results. When project-based learning is done well, we see these great outcomes that put students on the path to 21st century learning. Um, but sometimes we don't always see the same great um, outcomes. And, and several years ago, a, a group of us dug into the big driving question of how can we design the most beneficial the highest quality projects for our students so that they do get to those great outcomes. Um, and the graphic that you see here, I'm not going to go through all of it, but this, this gold standard PBL graphic helps us focus on what's really most important. And I think if you keep in mind that the learning goals at the center of any project are, uh, you know, of course you need to start with the end in mind. What are you trying to achieve with your students? So focusing on your learning goals, understanding the academic side of those, as well as those collaborative, critical thinking, creative skills. What are you trying to accomplish in this project? Be really clear on that as a teacher. And then everything around the outside is of equal importance to help you reach those learning goals, starting with a, a challenge that's worth tackling, often framed by a driving question, and then encouraging student questioning and inquiry throughout. We find that when projects are authentic, when students see the connection to the real world, um, they're more likely to engage and care about the issue. 
uh, we'll see examples today of students having voice and choice in their learning, reflecting on their learning throughout, getting feedback and time to apply it so that they can produce really high quality work. And then uh, at, in the end, create some sort of a product to share that's really going to engage an audience and that people will care about. In a really short nutshell, those are sort of the, the big things that you want to keep in mind. And I think one of the best ways uh, to start shifting your thinking, if you're familiar with projects, but the term project-based learning might be new to you, is to ask yourself, am I doing this whole extended learning experience that I just described, you know, starting with the great question and going through all these stages of learning to result in a final product, or am I just sort of tacking a project on at the end of what I've, um, a more traditional way of teaching? So with my, my colleagues at PBL Works, often talk about are you doing a project as dessert after the main learning is over, or is project-based learning really the unit of study? Is this how you're diving into important content and giving students this really rich and meaningful learning experience? And I think for, for all of us uh, in education, all of us who are adults now, most of us did not have the experience of the main course learning of project-based learning. This is a newer strategy. Many of us have had projects in our education. <clears throat> our teachers, you know, taught a unit and then said, okay, and now you're going to do a project, which you often did at home. You didn't necessarily share it with anyone other than the class or the teacher. Um, and it was often very hands-on. Project-based learning all leads to some sort of a final outcome and a product, but it doesn't necessarily have to be um, something hands-on. It might be a solution. But the big difference is that project-based learning experience is extending from start to finish. The, the product isn't just tacked on at the end after the, the kind of serious learning is over. It's not just dessert. It's the main, the main event, the main course. So let me share an example. And then I know that my colleagues here um, are going to share more examples today that are going to make this even more clear for you. So many of us have had experiences like this. This young man is sharing you know, his diorama that was assigned at the end of a unit of study, probably about habitats, if we look at what he's got there in his little box. We can imagine that every other student in the class probably made something similar, probably looked very much the same. We can kind of picture them uh, around the perimeter of the classroom. And I don't want to take anything away from hands-on activities. They're very important for learning, particularly for, for young learners. But we can imagine when this learning happened at the end of the unit of study. We can imagine where it happened, probably at home. And we can imagine that he didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. He might have chosen which habitat to display, but everybody in that class was assigned to make a habitat, we can imagine. Now, that's a dessert project, right? That's an activity that happens at the end of main course learning. And it's about habitats. Let's compare that with a different example. Here's an example from the US, you know, where I live. Another project with elementary students about habitats. That's what they needed to learn about. That was the learning goal that they were striving for. But it's very different than tacking on an activity at the end. In this case, the project began with an important challenge. Um, their local zoo had some new funding to build new habitats. So right off the bat, students had a Skype call, a video conference, with experts at the zoo, with the education staff at the zoo, talking about this opportunity to build new habitats. Now students had a challenge. What sort of habitats? What kind of animals would live there? How do you design habitats that are uh, suitable for animals and interesting for the animals who live there and also make really great um, exhibits for the visitors, particularly the children who come to the zoo? So on both sides, the children were really interested. The, uh, zoo staff was interested in what the kids had to offer because they became a really great focus group. Here are their ideal customers for the zoo, and they're going to share their thinking about what makes for a great exhibit. So they go through a rich inquiry process, learning all about habitats and about design, uh, and then they, uh, they develop their models. Each team uh, took a different approach of how they wanted to share their thinking, 
whether they wanted to do it in, you know, PowerPoints like this or make something uh, physical, a physical model. They didn't all look alike. They were not cookie cutters. It was up to the students to make their learning visible. And then they shared their models with that education staff. So they had an authentic audience. You can imagine the rich learning that happens all along the way. Of course, both groups of students, the one making the diorama and this group, uh, very invested in zoo design, um, they all learned about habitats. But you can imagine the learning going deeper in the additional 21st century skills of creativity and collaboration, being able to share your ideas, being much stronger uh, in this second experience. So this is why we talk about main course learning. Um, and before I uh, shift to my colleagues here, I just wanted to share what's happening, what I've been noticing happening in these last few months, where around the world, we've had to think about transforming education in a matter of moments sometimes. It just seems like uh, school transformation had to happen overnight as the pandemic hit and students were sent home. Um, many of them with technology and then teachers had to figure out what's the best way to help them continue learning from home. And for some teachers, this was an opportunity to continue doing project-based learning. Uh, the questions were, can we, can we keep doing this at home? What would it look like? I'm sharing a, a picture here of um, one project that continued where students had started the project in school when they were still face-to-face. -face. It was about water quality. They were very concerned about the quality of water. They lived near the ocean. They were con concerned about um, how the water quality was um, attracting the salmon, the fish that live um, and migrate through this waterway. Um, and then when they had to go home with their devices, when school had to be suspended face to face, they didn't want to give up on this project and neither did their teachers, but they had to use virtual tools so that they could continue the inquiry process. Uh, that meant that instead of going to the waterway themselves and talking to experts, they had virtual field trips and some scientists actually used cameras, you can see a picture here, and showed them around how do we go about gathering our water um, quality information? What does it look like where we do our work? How do scientists ask questions? All those wonderful questions that would have happened face to face, but they were able to do this virtually. And then students in their own neighborhoods, their own backyards, did their own water quality experiments. They gathered data, shared it, and made recommendations using virtual tools to keep talking and keep connecting and then shared their learning uh, with the virtual town hall. So they didn't wanna give up on any of the elements that make for really high quality project-based learning. They had to transform how it happened, where it happened, when it happened, because learning was happening from home, um, the regular daily schedule was disrupted, but they were able to continue focusing on those important elements student voice and choice, collaboration, all the things that made for really meaningful learning, and of course, the understanding of the science uh, that was involved. So it can happen at home, it's not easy, um, but I think we're gonna see some more examples going forward. And I think just by focusing on those essential elements, learning more about that, and thinking about how do I continue helping my students with main course learning, you're gonna create opportunities for your students to really learn deeply. Um, so just one, one uh, set of tips on how to get started, and then we're going to shift uh, to another presenter. A few of my favorite places to get started is to take a unit that you know well, you know the content well, maybe you've taught it in a very traditional way, remodel that into a project, bring in a driving question, frame this with real inquiry, lead to um, uh, connections beyond the classroom if you can, and think about Who's going to care about the work students are doing? Who might be a, an authentic audience for their work? So what the benefit there is you're going to know the, the unit content really well, but you're transforming how students interact with that material. Or perhaps you want to borrow a project that another teacher has done. Uh, PBL Works is one organization that has a, a big project library just ready and waiting for you to uh, borrow and adapt ideas from. That's another smart way to go. Sometimes teachers will start by looking at their standards and think about why do these standards matter in the world? What are these big ideas I'm trying to teach my students? And how do we use these ideas in the world outside of school? What sorts of professionals and experts use these concepts and what sort of work do they do? 
that might give you ideas for projects. And finally, my, my favorite, uh, because my roots are in journalism, I used to be a journalism teacher long ago, and that's to teach from the headlines. What's happening in the world right now that interests your students? There's so much going on right now that's so meaningful and affecting their lives, you know, every moment. If you can find connections to current events, to things that are happening, and getting students to think critically about that and to deepen their understanding about what's going on in their world, you're going to um, be on your way to creating some meaningful projects. So I'm going to pause there, um, and I know we're going to get to questions uh, in a little bit, but I'm going to pass this baton along. Thank you so much for that, Susie. I love that analogy of um, projects being seen more from the point of view uh, of being dessert uh, versus, um, you know, main course and how we sort of need to, to shift our approach from thinking about projects as being an end product, um, you know, like the example that you gave um, of, of a model or something that the child makes towards the end, which is something very prescriptive, as opposed to um, how we, we sort of need to look at projects as an evolving progression of, uh, of a student's learning or understanding of a particular uh, concept or big idea or real world connection. And it's, it's beautiful how you explained, uh, uh, you know, the example of the zoo. There are some interesting questions that have come in. And the first one I thought uh, you might like to take on yourself, Susie. This one is about um, how is project-based learning different from inquiry-based learning? Or are they really the same thing? So I thought uh, you might want to start with that one. Yes, I think there's so much in common there. Um, I, I think if we think of the big umbrella, it's inquiry. Um, you know, learning through asking questions, driving your own learning by finding out what you want to know. Inquiry doesn't necessarily have to lead to a product and an audience. That's where project-based learning comes in. So if you think of inquiry as the big tent, I think project-based learning is one application of inquiry. You can't do project-based learning well if you're not embedding uh, inquiry throughout the learning process, but it's just a, a, a different instructional design um, that really um, takes that inquiry into a, a process of learning that goes through these phases that I was talking about. Absolutely, so true. And um, there was another question about, um, uh, you know, how is it that we can uh, work on assessment models uh, when we move, uh, you know, from uh, move the, the, the whole idea of PBLs from dessert to main course. So what sort of assessments can we tack on to PBLs and how can we go about doing that? I thought that was also an interesting point. Sure, it's a, you know, a huge question. Uh, yeah. But I think that the short answer is in project-based learning, you put much more of your energy into formative assessment. So throughout the project, really tuning into how are students learning? What's the evidence of their learning? Um, it doesn't mean that you're doing more grading, but you're paying really close attention to learning as it's unfolding. So that assess assessment is something students themselves recognize as being really useful. Uh, and assessment doesn't necessarily have to come only from the teacher. Students can give each other critique. Uh, they learn critique strategies in PBL, which is a wonderful life skill, how to give and receive um, criticism and how to, to improve your work based on that. They might get critique and feedback from experts, content experts who um, are, are visitors to the classroom or that uh, students share their work with. And by the end of the project, you have this final summative product, which is being assessed uh, by a rubric, so you've shared in advance with students, what does high quality work look like? How do we know it when we see it? What is it we're aiming for? And all along the way, throughout that learning experience, students are working toward that final summative um, product. So by the time they get there, there should be no surprises. They should really understand the, the content well. They should have, um, you know, wonderful opportunities to improve um, their work to revision and you as a teacher have really great insights to their thinking all along the way. It's not just like giving a test or an assignment at the end and either they got it or they didn't. No, <laughs> you're finding out all along the way, are they learning? How can I deepen their learning? What's my next move as a teacher? Um, and then by the end, it's more looking back and reflecting. How did I get here? What was my growth over time? So it's a little bit different approach to assessment, but students find it really useful. Uh, which is a, a nice shift. 
That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that extremely comprehensive answer. Uh, Susie, you've covered everything from rubrics and success criteria to talking about <laughs> what we should do if at all, um, you know, we want to look at how much the student has learned over a period of time. And I think that really is the more important aspect of project-based learning as opposed to looking at the end product, uh, but exactly. more the process. And even if, uh, you know, there was a question um, that had come up a little while back, which talked about what happens if, you know, there is no tangible output. What happens if the student is not able to create something towards the end, which can be, you know, uh, displayed or showcased or whatever. So I, I'll open this up to other panelists also. You know, there, there may have been instances where the student was not able to create something uh, tangible at the end. What happens then? What do you do as an educator then? Right. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll let my colleagues share, but sometimes it'll be, it'll be a solution or an argument that you present. Um, it doesn't have to be a physical thing, but uh, I'll stop there and let my colleagues jump in. Uh, yeah, so Pallavi, even if talking about the process, you know, what went well and what did not go well is also a reflection and is a process of learning, right? So every time you'll not have the product, but uh, sharing that uh, this is where I struggled and this is where I needed support and this is what I've become good at. I think that's a great example of learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the most important part of uh, project-based learning is that is that inherent uh, iteration that comes in with your learning where you're constantly figuring out why something didn't work and then going back to see if you can do something else to make it work and then at the end of the day just come in and talk about okay I tried to do x I wasn't able to achieve it this is why I wasn't able to achieve it and this is maybe what I could do differently later on at some point in time and I think that is so beautiful um, you know, as a, as a way of learning uh, for students and something that we as educators can really, really push. Okay, so thank you for that, Susie, and thank you panelists for answering all these questions. There are so many questions. We'll keep coming back to these, uh, but uh, before I do that, I'll, um, uh, I'll now ask um, uh, Sandeep to go on and talk about how she's been looking at projects in, uh, in primary classrooms and uh, what project-based learning looks like uh, with the little ones. So over to you, Sandeep. Thank you, Pallavi, for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this webinar. So I'll just share my screen with you. Yeah, so can you see if you can help? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we kept it very simple in early years, like in the primary, we never wanted to make it very complex. We uh, actually just used the same tools which our children were comfortable uh, at, like they were comfortable using Padlet and Flipgrid. So we use these tools, familiar tools. And uh, also, uh, you know, designing a success criteria was Co co collaborated like we all work together to co-construct the success criteria what did high quality work look like what do i need to do how are we going to work on it so all these uh, questions or all these things were tapped in together with the teacher and the student and uh, for assessments we used a lot of reflection and exit tickets after every lesson and uh, the planning of the culmination was also uh, you know the onus was given to the students what how do they want to uh, uh, show their product or what do they want to show who's going to be the authentic audience so this was all decided by the students so we left it all together on the students so i'm going to share you uh, share with you uh, my unit, which was one second. I stop sharing. Yeah. So Pallavi, you'll have to give me a minute so that I just Yeah, so uh, the unit, thank you So the, for being patient. Yeah, so the unit, the inquiry was on solar system and how does uh, it support life, right? Uh, so uh, now this, as educators, like you, we felt that it, would, it was very heavy on content. 
and we weren't really sure that how our children are going to take it up and at the same time we want the onus to be taken by the students so as a team we sat down and we wanted to make the launch really well exciting for our students so you be use this uh, your puzzle uh, pieces puzzle app and we asked the students to pick this 24 piece puzzle and guess what the unit is going to be about so that was how we launched it with our students since they were young you know children like to uh, play games and explore things that is how we launched this and through the visible thinking strategy what i see i think i wonder we uh, had check their prior knowledge like what do you know about the solar system what do you think is uh, it is the unit is going to be about and what were your wonderings what are you, what do you what do you want to learn more about it so the wonderings helped us to get our driving questions now this was again a differentiated thing because each child had a different question right they that they wanted to inquire about it wasn't one thing that everybody was exploring the same thing or was working on the same project the children have different questions some wanted to know that are there any other planets where you have life and some wanted to know about uh, uh how can we find out uh, space and uh, what how can we explore what do we need how do we go and explore space you know there's some uh, children were curious to uh, inquire about rockets and spacecraft so this is how we collected the data on the padlet so once we had the data with us we divided it un under three broad questions that one was about solar system and there were a few children who wanted to explore about the earth and the moon and the others wanted to inquire about the spacecrafts and rockets and all. So we put these broad three questions up on the padlet and also along with that since we knew that uh, it was a virtual uh, classroom and the children did not have an access to books and uh, you know people whom they could talk to so we created a resource bank where we had posted all the books and we had sites where our students could go research find out more about them so this again resource was shared with the students where they could uh, independently inquire into things and post it so they that is how they were adding but along before this we also asked them why do you a lot of why and how questions like why do you want to talk about why do you want to explore this why do you want to know about it how are you going to go about finding and researching it and uh, what 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 are you going to do once you have this information what will you do with it Right, so all these questions were posted uh, to the students and this just helped them to uh, sort their thoughts and articulate their understanding. So this, uh, again, um, the resource was shared uh, with the students and they had access to it. They were going back and forth, putting their ideas here. That was the first step and also giving feedbacks or liking and in case they were using any other resource they were adding to the resource bank so that that is how the collaboration was happening in a virtual classroom uh, and then after this the data when it was there the children would present their understanding during the circle time there were they were reading out books they were talking they were sharing uh, printouts and uh, uh, also like this there was this one big uh, you know glitch that was that uh, children had different bandwidth and now you couldn't uh, see what everybody was presenting so we asked uh, the children to upload their videos on the flipgrid we used flipgrid again as a tool to upload the presentation so that the children could give the feedback to their peers at their convenient time so uh, also uh, now here when uh, they were presenting we looked at what was high quality work how did it look like the kind of feedback one needs to give to each other you know and that too also in a positive way because at times you know young children can be really rude so you know teaching what what is very what, what did they like about it followed by how can you improve on it so these were a few strategies that we used in the class and the voice level which was so important holding their presentations up high listening to each other and not blurting and interrupting were a couple of social skills that they picked up during this journey 
uh, and uh, if you uh, see in the, these pictures, there uh, was a diversity that we saw. They had built connections through different disciplines. Children were uh, sharing their research and their work through their posters. And uh, this girl down there, she used a hula hoop to explain what rotation was. What, like that was something amazing, creating models up here, if you see a child is actually trying to see, he's made a rocket with the paper and he wanted to see how far it can, you know, go up in the air. And some observation, like what did they, uh, what did they see in the sky at night? Because th th these days, the sky is pretty clear, you know, there's no pollution, so you could see everything. So then again, like if you see, they had developed their research skills by asking, um, you know, meaningful questions, recording, planning their how to put down their observations so this was how they were developing their different skill sets uh, and uh, not to miss we also mapped our literacy standards and through the unit we pulled out books uh, where we uh, we were focusing on reading informational text and uh, also uh, you know like using various text features like glossary and headings and all. And again, then a lot of differentiation, differentiation was done because the books were that we pull, pulled out were, uh, you know, according to the reader's level. So this would happen in a small group uh, synchronous time where one group was reading a book and they were for finding meaning. Then we used used ed puzzle for comprehension uploading the videos and asking students to com comprehend and post their answers on the lms that was learning management system that we had in school so that was another tool that we were using and uh, uh, the other group was working on again if, uh, uh, you know uh, assigned books uh, of their age level on the ras kids so this is how what how we were mapping up the literacy stand standards and we were working towards it and for numeracy we looked at reading and writing time children made their own they planned their own schedule because since they were looking at the movement of the earth and how it was affecting us so also you know the, how we need to balance uh, our time keeping in mind that we are spending less time on screen and we are working uh, you know, on other areas also. So this is how we got our numeracy standards into it. And towards the end now, uh, we wanted to, uh, we worked together again as a team. We came back uh, with the students and in a circle time, we discussed that now we have so much, what, how do we go further? How do we need to, you know, who's going to be an audience? Who, where do we need to go and share? So what, was the most exciting was they came up with that they could share their work with extended relatives because since now this was a virtual thing the zoom links were shared with their uh, extended families their friends parents and also the senior leadership team and teachers in this school and uh, their children had all that they had picked up during small group classes in different subjects that was dis displayed. And like Susie said, there was, uh, you know, they weren't cookie cutters. They were sharing their uh, learning through different ways. If you see this girl, she's created the whole world wo word wall. And uh, she's, tr she's show trying to show what connection. She's got time there. The she's got the you know, a vocabulary that she picked up. The boy up there is, he's, he, he used a mind craft uh, again to display the uh, Earth's rotation and revolution. And, and this boy here was just articulating uh, his understanding. So what led in the end, like uh, the children could uh, share about different planets and the characteristics. There was, they knew what dwarf planets are, rotation and revolution, space, crafts and satellites. Now the skills that they had picked up was they could frame meaningful questions. They could observe and record their observation, collaborate in with their virtually also. They knew how to go on various tools and give the feedback, take feedback and ask, uh, you know, probably put in a question, driving question and say, okay, come, let's participate and build a conversation there. They were they, they could build connection across different disciplines and uh, 
they had become creative independent and communicator they felt so proud because they were the owners of their learning they could share it with the whole team and through uh, during the culmination they shared what went well what did not go well what they were still struggling with and they still wanted to find more of it so this was what the journey of uh, first graders looked like during the project based learning yeah so that's it uh, and i would uh, let pallavi take over now thank you so much for those amazing ideas sandeep from fantastic it's really always so wonderful to to actually observe what project based learning would look like in a classroom um and for me it particularly it's exciting because there's never one end product there are so many variations to that same assignment or task or inquiry that you set out for your students and it's so wonderful to see how children come up with their own interpretations of that Uh, of that project and that really is the beauty uh, of project based learning that you know uh, at the end of the day um, you might have asked them to go out and explore something about the solar system uh, and you know like you showcased that there was one kid who talked about rotation using a hula hoop and there's quite another who came up with a little model of a working rocket to show you how uh, you know uh, perhaps uh, uh, rockets are launched into outer space and so on so it's amazing to see how students minds work and what kind of things excite them and the kind of connections that they make so which is why i think pbls are so so beautiful um okay so a couple of questions uh, based on your uh, presentation sandeep one was to do with the tool that you've used for making the puzzle um i wasn't quite sure uh, what they meant by puzzle i think uh, sandeep if you want to just take that quickly Yeah, so Pallavi, there's a tool where you have this jigsaw puzzle, uh, and uh, you uh, just type in the topic, and it gets you, and it gives you an option if you want a 24-piece puzzle or a, a 64. And uh, according to the learners, you can post the link, and it's very easy. You can also operate it from your phone, so that you really don't need help of your parents. So all that you go there and fix the puzzle and try to figure out what what is going to be. So that just to add a little curiosity. i we thought that that was something different and especially when you know now there's so much focus on play we thought we could get it get this uh, in yeah that's fantastic and what is the tool called sandeep uh jigsaw puzzle uh, just i can probably look for it and put it in the link or pale uh, in the chat box and yeah, that'll be great thank you so much it. for that sandeep thanks a lot yeah. um yeah. there was also one other question um which came up which was talking about um how we can connect project based learning to the different dimensions of uh, the four c's or when we lo look at 21st century skill development um so i'm going to open this out to all three of you uh, to get your sense on how do we connect uh, project based learning and build uh, important uh, 21st century skills through that yeah Sandeep, uh, would you like to take that one, or should I, uh, Janvi? Maybe you might want to start out with this one. I just, I just thought that uh, Janvi, <laughs> just giving it to Janvi, and then probably adding it there. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Balavi. So uh, when we talk about four Cs, that is. Uh, create, communicate, uh, collaborate, and critical thinking. Uh, I think. Uh, so when when we assign projects to students uh we have to uh when we pose those uh, driving questions to them okay uh that the pro the driving questions actually lead to that critical thinking they start thinking from different uh, dimensions about um, a particular idea uh for example when i talk about my project i'll i'll share how um when i posed this question uh, because in my project i uh, integrated uh, the religious cultural and environmental um, aspects so uh, what happens is where when i posed this question to them what do, what do you think why why so okay um the driving questions are extremely important they lead to the critical thinking aspect you know because they start thinking that oh yes we haven't thought about this before let's try working on it okay uh, like for example the project i'm going to talk about is the environment i was uh, we were studying in a unit we were studying about how uh, 
festivals uh, impact the environment okay and uh, usually we talk about festivals from the religious and cultural aspect so that's where they where the environmental aspect came into picture and they started thinking thinking about it uh, yes uh, pbl helps in collaborative learning because they all put their heads together they start exchanging um, ideas they start exchanging uh, their experiences because that's what happened when we were talking about different festivals they started uh, you know sharing how they celebrate the festival and then they started reflecting on that uh, was this the right way of celebrating festival they went on to research they went on to find out uh, how the festivals were being celebrated like centuries ago why were why did the festivals originate uh, you know in first place and how uh, the fest uh, celebration or the ways of celebration have changed um, across centuries. Uh, when we talk about, yeah, that's collaborating. Communication, I think the tools I use, uh, pen pal schools helps me a lot when it comes to communication because um, it uh, children, uh, I mean, my students actually, they, they know that uh, they have to share feedback. And uh, as Sandeep highlighted that, you know, we have to teach them that first you start with uh, the positive feedback and then you move on to uh, the areas of improvement. So uh, they are very, they have uh, this, you know, in hand, they enhance their writing skills, their reading skills, they work on that. And then uh, they are extremely cautious about what they share as feedback. Uh, also, they start working together so they know that they have to respect the other person's opinion. They have to, uh, you know, uh, buy in. Uh, that that uh, buy in is important that, you know, I, okay, if I share this, my partner also needs to give uh, whatever he's saying isn't wrong or whatever she says is also not wrong. We, uh, we are correct. That's his perspective. This is mine. So that respect, the mutual respect and mutual buy in is brought into picture. This is, I feel that PBL helps us, uh, you know, to uh, to develop these 21st century skills. And through my presentation, I think I will share how my children, you know, uh, you know, their skills, their, they worked on these 21st century skills, how they improved uh, by working on the projects in Pen Pal schools. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. And we'd love to know more about these projects, and we'll come back to your presentation in a quick bit. Susie, there was one particular question that I was hoping you'd be able to answer for us, and this is uh, a particularly painful one uh, within the Indian context, which is that um, uh, we've got, for a lot of schools, um, uh, you know, especially our state board and national board schools, uh, we have huge amounts of syllabus um, that teachers need to be able to complete. And oftentimes, one of the biggest challenges in including project-based learning uh, within the classroom is that how do I how do I cover everything that I need to cover all my must do's, uh, you know, things that I need to introduce to class and also accommodate a project alongside that. Um, how do we, you know, make sure that um, uh, we were able to manage time effectively. So loads of people asking that question and I thought you might like to take that one up. Sure. And it's a huge question, not only in India, but really around the world. You know, we all have learning standards that um, you know, we, we have to be accountable to. And I think the big shift in thinking is the project, project based learning is not on top of your curriculum, it becomes your curriculum. Um, so think about how much time you would spend in a unit in a more traditional way to address your learning goals. That's the same amount of time you're going to spend in a project and you're going to go really deeply into that content. What we find in, from the research side is that when students have these project-based experiences that really have strong learning goals, they're able to hold on to that learning. So it's not just racing through the curriculum and cover, 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 but really uncovering understanding and getting to that deep learning so you can transfer it and apply it to a new situation. That really makes the learning stick. So for, for educators, it's a chance to, to make sure you're you're helping students learning meaningful things, but in a way that will really stay with them and not just be, okay, check the box, check the box, covered it, covered it. You know, you, you really want them to own this. When we talk about students owning their learning, um, I think that's the big difference. So as you're designing the project, you think about how much time is this big learning goal worth? And then sometimes you can bring in additional kind of smaller, lower level standards um, uh, and or, or um, revisit some that you've perhaps taught before, reviewing them, but you want to focus on a learning goal that's going to be worth the amount of time that you put into the project. 
So that's the short answer, I think. Yeah. I think yeah. there is no short answer. Sandeep, uh, over to you. Yeah, Pallavi, I also thought like, you know, if you have transdisciplinary connection or you have a conceptual understanding that you try and build in through different subjects, that also helps you, uh, you know, cover, uh, uh, bring in your other disciplines into it. So that was just one. Yeah, there was also another interesting question about how, whether or not we can actually do uh, project-based learning across different subjects and, you know, include um, all sorts of different subjects into one particular project. And I think that that's, that, that really is uh, what a project is about, you know, where you're sort of encouraging connections between different uh, subjects. And I think most, most teachers should try and explore something along those lines um, if, they're, if they're keen to do that. Okay, great. On that lovely note, I'm going to pass, um, pass this over to our last panelist for the evening, uh, Janvi, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about what she's been doing in her social studies and English classrooms, and also talk to us about all the fun stuff with pen pal schools. So over to you, uh, Janvi. Thank you so much, Pandavi. And just go ahead and share my screen. Please. All right, so uh, thank you. Uh, right, I'm going to talk about how online learning platform Penpal Schools has helped me. So I teach uh, secondary section, higher grades, grade eight and nine, and I teach uh, English and social studies. And uh, I was looking for something where I could, uh, you know, incorporate all the um, four C's and then, uh, you know, more skills and how I could help my children enhance my skills. In fact, uh, to answer to one of your questions uh, that you just asked that in, in India, where the curriculum is so vast, how do we, uh, you know, uh, how do we use PBL? So um, that's that's the same challenge I faced when I started using Penpal schools uh, and um, or, or incorporating PBL in my uh, in my teaching. So uh, uh, not, uh, what I started using uh, PBL for uh, initially was uh, my club activities. So if you have any school uh, clubs, uh, you know, you could start with uh, PBL as a club activity and then move on to the main curriculum or topics or units that you want to teach. Uh, so I'm going to share a bit about Penpal Schools. Uh, it is an online learning platform uh, with uh, ready-made uh, units, projects, lessons, and discuss, uh, discussion questions for students around uh, the world. They learn together. It's, it's a very good opportunity for students to interact with children uh, across the world uh, who are uh, their age, their peers, because we do have age brackets. Also, uh, Penpal schools, they start with uh, when, whenever you opt for a project. Uh, you have a variety of projects, uh, you know, covering various subjects uh, from literature to uh, sciences to robotics to uh, social sciences to environmental studies, a lot of uh, topics that are covered by Penpal schools. So that helps a lot. Uh, children do work together. So uh, the interesting part is that it, uh, you know, they interact with students who are from different countries, different cultures. So uh, they learn that mutual respect. Uh, they learn to accept the views and opinions of other students. Okay, so that's that's an amazing way of uh, you know getting feedback, sharing, exchanging ideas, okay, and opinions. So here I brought. Uh, two projects that I worked with. Uh, there was one project which was purely uh, using Penpal schools and another project that I uh, worked on was, um, you know, using different tools. So uh, I'm going to talk about this one particular project which I started with and that was about environment, as I, I discussed earlier. Uh, this, this idea came uh, just before uh, Diwali, okay, and uh, we were talking about environment and environmental studies, and that's when uh, these grade eight students they come up, they came up with this thought of you know, uh, what, how, why are festivals so important, and then we developed this unit for uh, environment. Uh, we started with the thought that uh, you know how do festivals impact the environment, okay, and. Uh, 
we picked up a few articles from resource material from uh, National Geographic uh, and other um, resources. And uh, my first step was to give them uh, the material to study. So they conducted research on these topics. They chose uh, their own festival. Uh, of course, India is a land of festivals. So we have uh, several festivals and they chose that, okay, I want to study Diwali or I want to study um, Holi and, uh, or whatever. And uh, they picked up their own driving questions. So uh, gradually in the process of research, okay, they, they found out what, when did this festival begin? Uh, what, what, how was it celebrated earlier? How did it uh, change over a period of time, uh, the celebration and the importance, and how is it being celebrated today? And uh, that's how they integrated their ideas. So uh, PBL helps a lot of uh, integration of ideas, finding answers to the driving questions. Uh, then, of course, uh, communication and collaboration uh, when when they started sharing, they started exchanging ideas. Uh, I have put in a snapshot of how uh, children use uh, pen pal schools. So pen pal schools gives us different units and questions, and uh, children uh, put their responses on it. They share their responses, and of course, uh, they are connected to different pen pals from different countries. And you can see that uh, one of my students, Advik, was interacting with uh, somebody from Mongolia and a student from the United States. So, uh, it, and it's it's wonderful to read their responses because sometimes they uh, the children share ideas which are completely different and un unimaginable. And, uh, and the interesting part was that. Uh, Children from other countries also could relate to what my student was talking about celebrating festivals in India. So uh, that's about it. Then uh, one thing I really love about PBL is the ownership of their learning. They, because they frame their own driving questions, they uh, you know the student voice and student choice comes into picture. They take ownership of their learning. They are not forced to uh, you know work on a topic. Okay, you give them a broader unit. Okay, when, when I spoke to them, I said, okay, it's environment uh, or effect of festivals on environment. Now you choose what you want to work upon. So uh, they, they did take ownership of their learning. Uh, here is a, a snapshot of what my child responded. Uh, and uh, uh, just next to that the slide, you can see my response to my student. So uh, this is another uh, interesting feature of pen pal schools where you can uh, give feedback real time. You can uh, evaluate uh, and give lesson grade to every response that a student puts up. Okay. Along with that, the feature is that it allows you to see uh, what uh, the student is exchanging with their with their pen pals. So. Um, uh, of course, they are extremely cautious about what they write, okay, how they write, they frame their responses, then they post it on the website so uh, or the learning platforms uh, that enhances their uh, writing skills. They read and they respond, so that also enhances their comprehension uh, and reading skills. This is another example here when I was, uh, when we were studying um, freedom. Okay, we were talking about uh, discrimination and freedom. This, uh, so here is where uh, students use different tools to showcase what, what their learning was. So there is a, when, when I spoke about discrimination, discrimination is not just gender discrimination. It could be any kind of discrimination. So my students chose that uh, I would want to uh, research on gender discrimination. I would want to research on racial discrimination. Okay, and they chose, some of them used padlets. Another one, uh, while studying discrimination, came up with a completely different picture and uh, moved on to American War of Independence. And uh, that is an example of uh, uh, a lucid chart. So he wanted to showcase this. So I think PBL enhances creativity. This again uh, is a feature in pen pal schools, which I love the most because at the end of the project, uh, so we do have videos related to your um, driving question. And at the end of the pro session, the end of the project, children can upload the project or their learning the way they want. So if it's a student chooses to put a video, they can put a video. If a student chooses to put a presentation or a write-up, okay, they can do that. And it, uh, there is a complete freedom 
to my students to uh, showcase their work. And as uh, Sandeep said earlier, that you know, it is not the outcome that matters, it is the process which matters. And in this process of learning, if my child has made something creative, something wonderful, I think uh, that's, that's more than enough for me because in the process of learning about the environment and the festivals, my child has also learned another skill of maybe writing or of maybe preparing a presentation or maybe using a new tool. I usually keep a, a tool bank, a bank or resource bank of tools which I want my children to use for a particular project. And, uh, you know, they, they choose, they pick and choose what they want to use. Uh, I have already spoken about this, that it develops uh, reading, writing and comprehension skills. You can see a snapshot where my student has actually written about uh, air pollution uh, when the student was researching on pollution and how it impacts the environment. Uh, these are a few snapshots like uh, of uh, surveys that my children conducted. Okay, uh, so they went on to talk to their peers in school. They conducted surveys, then they wrote reflection. Okay, uh, and these are the snapshots of the reflections and the surveys again from pen pal schools and also uh, using a, a worksheet. A very important skill uh, that develops through PBL and especially online learning platforms is digital citizenship. And it is a must. It, I think uh, before we introduce children to any online platform uh, where they are interacting, uh, it is important that we, uh, you know, edu uh, we educate them or we uh, brief them about digital citizenship and being responsible di digital citizens because, uh, you know, uh, in, Children must be um, aware that they're going to exchange things with someone they do not know. It's an online platform. So uh, yes, uh, we do conduct a session of digital uh, citizenship or how they should be, what information should they be sharing, what information should, uh, or what sites uh, or resources should they explore. PBL helps students to become outcome driven Okay, and in this project where I was working on uh, the effects of festivals, my students uh, identified that, uh, you know, festivals do harm the, uh, they impact the environment, bursting crackers or maybe using colors and wasting water during Holi or, uh, you know, uh, in Makar Sankranti when we fly kites, it kills birds. So. They, they actually got a different perspective of the festivals and uh, Along with that, they did not lose respect. So uh, when, when we came to this point of project, I, I asked them to find out ways. I asked them to research on ways in which they could uh, celebrate the festival. The essence is not lost, but uh, the impact on the environment is minimized. And uh, my children came up with beautiful ideas. They jotted them down, they prepared presentations, and um, they were they became outcome driven not only that they also shared their presentations with uh, their peers you can see that um, in the pictures you have these students going to different classrooms and sharing their uh, presentations and sharing their ideas and views so this was a wonderful journey uh, here of course we we've not only used pen pal schools but we also used other different tools Okay, and uh, then the platform we used to showcase student work was uh, Seesaw. Pental Schools also has a wonderful uh, option. Uh, it is important to showcase student work. Either you showcase it, uh, I feel, uh, to their peers or and also the parents. Sometimes parents are extremely curious about knowing what the child is learning or doing. So uh, this helps me a lot. Penpal Schools has an option of inviting parents. Uh, Seesaw also uh, is another tool where you know you can invite parents to view it. There are various other ways to invite parents and showcase the student work is what I feel uh, should be done. Uh, at the end, the reflection part. Uh, this is uh, something I love the most. After they finish their project, I want my children to reflect on what they've learned. I want them to understand it, it, it's, it's their learning. So, uh, you know, I, it's not important that every child should excel in what they do, but their learning is important. So when they write their reflections, uh, I think I'm, I'm extremely happy and uh, 
my students love this platform of pen pal schools for their pbl and i make sure that uh, somewhere i integrate this with my projects so um i think i'll stop here pallavi thank you so much thank you so much for for all of that amazing sharing jandi it's fantastic to see the kind of projects that you've been doing and also the wide spectrum of skills uh, that you've really been able to pack into one project uh, and i think that that is a that's a great example to all for the all the teachers who were trying to understand what are the different kinds of things that we can possibly do with a pbl i mean you've covered uh you know within a one particular project you've covered everything from geography to environmental conservation to how do i express myself effectively to research skills and that's fantastic and that really is uh the beauty of project based learning in terms of you know both the length the breadth and the depth of learning uh that we can achieve with that uh we have time for just two very quick questions where we're already we've already overshot and i know this is a fantastic discussion and we want to keep it going but uh, we will have to close soon so two very quick questions opening both of these up to uh, to all of you um one was of course uh, uh, to do with time frame uh so this of course goes out to all three of you in terms of how do you what kind of time frames do you set for projects and what are some recommended time frames uh, for projects uh, so janvi maybe if you could start with talking about your time frame for one of the projects that you had shared right so uh, since uh, i told you then uh, you know it is difficult to integrate the projects in my curriculum or uh, state curriculum or the national curriculum so what i do is i keep 30 minutes a week uh, i think that's more than enough for my students to do their research uh, and uh, of course uh, they can ex uh, sometimes i i allow them to decide that how much time would you take uh, with pen pal schools uh, the good part is that it it is divided it's 30 minutes every week so uh, within a span of 4 weeks i think i can complete a project in uh, using pen pal schools if i have to add some more uh, things to uh, pb uh, pen pal schools or to pbl then of course i give them more time so maybe 30 minutes uh, twice a week uh, i think that suffices for me super Sandeep, what about you? With the little ones, how long does this? Yeah, take? so it is around six to eight weeks, Pallavi, and also that I'm into a PYP curriculum and IB curriculum, so the unit is spread that long, and it's through an inquiry approach and everything, mm -hmm. and the conceptual understanding. So it work takes around six to eight weeks. Easy. Six to eight weeks. Okay, Suzy, what according to you is a is a good timeline for uh, for PBLs? Yeah, you know, there's not a set answer. I think what I would say is. you need to allow enough time to go through that whole inquiry experience so enough time to hook their interest you know with some sort of an entry event get into that driving question time to develop their understanding through some research background building time to apply it by creating a product or solution and then sharing it so with little ones that's going to take a different length of time than with older ones and with more interdisciplinary projects the more content you bring in the more time you need So there's not a magic answer but you need to allow enough time for the whole process to unfold. Super, that's great. Okay, one last question before uh before we leave uh which is any specific guidelines that or tips or strategies that you'd like to share when we're doing PBLs online and remotely. You know, some teachers would be struggling with um uh you know giving giving out time specifically for students to work collaboratively what are some ways in which we can make pbls just as successful uh, when we're working online and remotely yeah so like i shared that you know uh, if you're working either the uh, the process can be the same if you're working virtually or uh, if you are trying to bring in different tools then don't get too many things at at one go that that might just get very overwhelming uh, for the teacher and the student and you need to plan bite size small things and you should be open to the way it's going you know uh, some children might not respond to the way you've thought so you should be the open to the idea of tweaking in your plans reflecting going back and how you can add value to the whole learning process 
rather than uh, i understand that standards and practices like uh, uh, are there but then also you need to very carefully look into all those things so either you have don't get too many elements into it that is what i feel yeah and Absolutely. suzy can share more and uh, of course we're learning from teachers around the world who are having to do this and i think one of the things we're hearing is that the relationship piece is so important online mm -hmm. um, you know students are thrown in this new situation they're missing their friends they're missing their teachers so building in time for those just quick check-ins you know how are you doing if you do like a morning circle uh, in your face-to-face uh, -face classroom have some sort of a circle time when you're getting together face-to-face -to -face. and don't think that you have to be on the screen all the time that there should be some um, some sharing of learning online and then as as we've heard in these examples send them to resources have them do some things on their own in their own homes create models uh, you know test out their learning um, away from the screen so that mix of screen time and then um, offline learning i think is going to be really important and just remembering how important relationships are for the learning process those would be my tips Absolutely. And on that wonderful note, I'd like to thank all of you um, panelists as well as participants for this absolutely fantastic session. Um, you know, one of those, this, this is one of those sessions that actually um, uh, makes me as an educator really value uh, what we do in the classroom because this, this, really, this really boils down to uh, what, what learning actually means and should translate into uh, when we're trying to look at what Susie started the session out with, what kind of kids are we really sending out into the world and what does that need to look like and what role do we as educators have to play in that process. Um, so thank you, Susie. Thank you, Sandeep. And thank you, Janvi, for what a wonderful uh, session and for all of the great ideas and tips and strategies and learning. Uh, and to all the wonderful participants that came in today for all the fantastic questions that you asked, let's keep the learning going and the sharing going. And here's hoping that all of you have a wonderful week ahead. Stay safe, teach on, and thank you very much for being a part of the Summer of Learning. Thank you all. Wonderful. Have a good week ahead. Wonderful. Thanks thank for the opportunity. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks, panelists. Thank Great examples. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.